Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Доброе утро всем. Как всегда, еще пару минут и начнем. Так, коллеги, доброе утро. Пока на русском мы еще не совсем начинаем. Я вижу, люди еще прибавляются в основном канале, поэтому прошу подождать еще, наверное, три минутки, и мы начнем. Я пока напомню, что то, что я только что написал в чате, чтобы, если кто-то забыл или новый, чтобы подключиться к экрану, который... СЖН сейчас я отшарил. Вам нужно подключиться сначала к голосовому каналу, основной, это слева в левой панели в Дискорде, и там вы увидите красную такую блямбу в эфире напротив имени Евгений. Туда наводите, и там появляется присоединиться к экрану или что-то такое, я не помню, как это называется, вот, и нажимаете, все должно работать. Сейчас на экране заголовок презентации Маливирус Камчатка и так далее на фоне электронной микрофотографии. Все понятно. Отлично. Женя, ты смотришь стрим? Он э, в порядке? Да, три в порядке, там трое, я один из троих. Ну да, да. Потому что я, я выключил, но я могу смотреть в YouTube Studio. Но, возможно, до меня комментарии будут доходить с опозданием. Потому что иначе фонит, мне в наушники идет мой же голос или голос докладчик. Да, хорошо, я буду смотреть, и если там будут какие-то вопросы или комментарии, я буду в чатик сюда писать. 
Ну, Может, или, озвучив... ну... или озвучивай сам там, как удобнее будет, походу. Ладно, хорошо. Угу. Ну что, начнем тогда, да, наверное? Дети да, я думаю, наверное, можно. Окей, so, ladies and gentlemen, morning, and uh, welcome to our first, I would say, foreign session of Open Science Seminar. <laughs> and uh, I'm very glad to introduce you, Jean Christophe Roux, a last year PhD student from uh, the Laboratory of Genomic and Structural Information from uh, Marseille, France. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, the head of this lab, uh, Jean-Michel Flavery. He was here a couple of times and gave talks about giant viruses. Uh, it's a very hot uh, topic now. And um, this lab is uh, one of the pioneering and uh, leading, still leading labs uh, in discovering new viruses and uh, new mechanisms about how those viruses work. And uh, an important thing I would like to say, uh, uh, why uh, particularly I like this lab, uh, but of course, except of uh, some of them are my friends. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this lab is, um, It, it consists of several units. It has uh, wet lab, bioinformatics, uh, chromatography, crystallography, uh, maybe something else. Uh, as Jen will tell us, I hope. But uh, those units do not work separately. They are all subdued, uh, subordinated to the common goal. And this allows to make a uh, real top grade world level research. And uh, this is how feats probably should work uh, in our imagination and uh, in future in reality, I hope. And uh, today uh, we have a unique opportunity, really unique opportunity to uh, watch, uh, to see um, a piece, a brand new piece of this uh, top grade research about giant viruses. So, uh, new family, Moliverida, new species from Kamchatka, and Jean Christophe Roux. Uh, please, Jean. Thank you. Thank you, Stas, for the really nice introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, as you mentioned it, I'm uh, part of the um, Uh, IGS lab in Marseille, and uh, uh, I guess I can be called uh, aspirant, if I'm uh, correct. Uh, I started my thesis like two and a half years ago, and now I'm finishing. And uh, I will talk to you about uh, indeed uh, giant viruses, but um, also uh, about the research I um, Yeah, of course. Uh, please feel free to uh, interrupt me. That's uh, the the. It's to me the best way to uh, to present my work, so that we can, you know, uh, discuss and chat at the same time. It it needs to be really uh, lively. So uh, let's start now with uh, indeed the the discovery of the a new molivirus called uh, molivirus Kamchatka, which is the second representative of the proposed Moliviridae family. So um, first uh, first of all, uh, those are the little babies or at least little giants we're studying at the lab. So uh, we are studying uh, the five main historical uh, giant viruses families. So the Marseille vi uh, virus, Mimi virus, Pandora virus, Molivirus and Pitovirus. And the first thing I would like to share with you is that uh, the reason why we call them giant viruses, it's because uh, they are really big, meaning that for some of them, including pitovirus or pandora virus, the um, capsid is bigger than some of uh, 
the main bacteria, the common bacteria, such as Escherichia E. coli, for instance. E. coli is about the same uh, size as pitovirus, meaning that the, all those five, five families of giant viruses can be seen under light microscopy. And for kind of scale, I put also rhinovirus and HIV, which are, are obviously not giant viruses, so that you can compare the, the size of the rhinovirus with the viruses we're studying at the IGS lab. So the frame of this presentation is as follow. Um, I will do a quick uh, histor history of, uh, of virology because to me it's like really interesting. It's something uh, during the confinement, of course, I was forced to read instead of uh, running experiments. So I got really interested in, in how virology came out and, and how this uh, became a discipline that is now uh, autonomous and is not um, is a yes it's a, a, a field of study itself then I will uh, introduce you to uh, how we discovered the first mini virus at the lab and uh, how this uh, opened a new uh, era in uh, virology then I will talk to you about the first molivirus that has ever been discovered which is molivirus sibericum which was reactivated from um, a permafrost samples that uh, we were able to retrieve in the lab, thanks to uh, the collaboration in between our two teams. Then I will uh, focus on uh, my PhD work about Molivirus Kamchatka, which is the first modern uh, molivirus ever discovered, which led to some uh, comparative genomics analysis that I will present you. And as a conclusion, and I hope it will open a debate in between uh, us. I will uh, talk to you about uh, all the dogmas that have been broken by the discovery of those giant viruses. So uh, please feel free to interrupt me whenever you have questions or remarks or anything. So let's begin with this uh, little history of biology. Uh, if you consider uh, virology itself as a discipline, it's pretty recent. It's like pretty uh, new, pretty new um, domain, which started with uh, in the 50s. But if you look back at history, then you find out that uh, virology wouldn't exist without microbiology and the first discovery uh, of medicine. In, for instance, if you take the work of Discoid Pedianos, which was um, Greek, uh, one of the first Greek doctors, so-called doctor, and uh, he tried to um, gather all the empirical uh, data that that they had at this time of how to cure what they called poisons, which are were actually diseases. And if you take the word poison in Latin, in turn, it's it turns into virus. The translation of poison in Latin is virus. So this is the first use of the term virus uh, at that time. So if you take, if you go like um, uh, 1,500 years later, during all this period of time, poison were considered to be uh, transmitted through fog. And it was called the miasma theory. And the first one who tried to uh, investigate the reason why you could transmit some disease in between people was Girolamo Fracastoro, which was an Italian uh, scientist, and said, okay, perhaps in this fog, this poisonous fog, you have some seeds that may uh, transmit the diseases in between people. But at that time, uh, the dogma of the uh, miasma theory was too strong for Fra Fracastoro to... Uh, uh, dig deeper into this uh, idea of se seeds that could be able to transmit diseases. So uh, we had to wait until the work of Louis Pasteur and his PhD student Charles Chamberlain about uh, I hygiene, uh, hygiene. Both of them uh, started to uh, look at how to sterilize uh, culture mediums and water and 
Charles Chamberlain created what we call the Chamberlain filter, who was a 0.2 micrometer uh, filter that could sterilize water. And they discovered that if you use sterile water, then you don't have spontaneous life, meaning that uh, this uh, experiment was able to overthrow the theory of miasma to um, to go to the uh, theory of um, contagion freedom. So uh, basically from this period of time, without uh, having the knowledge of their discovery, uh, Pasteur and Chamberlain created the first um, uh, the first um, tool to discriminate in between uh, different types of pathogens agents. Indeed, uh, they didn't know at that time that uh, some of the pathogenic agent could go through the Chamberlain filter, including the viruses we know now. Sorry, and, sorry. Yes. Uh, I have one request. Uh, can you use uh, cursor to point on on the slide? The pointer on the slide? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. It's more clear. <laughs> yeah, this is actually the how uh, the Chamberlain filter looked like at that time. It was something you were putting on the um, top wa running water, and the water wa was getting through, and all the pathogenic agents they knew at that time uh, were supposed to be stuck on the filter. And this was uh, a great uh, way to increase people's health at that period of time. And it goes also with the development of medical techniques and stuff. So it's really a creative period in terms of uh, uh, science and microbiology. But you have to wait until the work of Dmitry Ivanovsky, which was a Russian botanist, uh, to, um, uh, to see that the concept of virus appear, to see the concept of virus appearing. Uh, at that time, Dmitry Ivanovsky had this idea he had like tobacco plants and they were, they were having a disease. The, the leaves were uh, getting uh, mold. So he decided to grind it and uh, to uh, uh, do a mixture that went through the Chamberlain filter, retrieve what was uh, getting through the Chamberlain filter and infect uh, healthy tobacco plants. And he discovered that actually, even though uh, it has been filtrated through the Chamberlain filter, the uh, healthy plants of tobacco were having the same disease from the tobacco plant that was grinded. And at, at that time, Dmitry Ivanovsky was a really young scientist. He was still a PhD student and he wasn't really, uh, let's say, self-confident enough to say, okay, guys, I discovered a new type of pathogenic agents with, which are actually through getting through the Chamberlain filter. But still, he was the first uh, scientist to point out that some of the pathogenic agents uh, could go through the Chamberlain filter. And then a few years later, uh, we're here. Uh, Bejering, who was a um, Dutch guy, Dutch scientist, uh, without knowing the work of Dmitry Ivanovsky, uh, did the, the same experiment. And he concluded, uh, compared, to, which is the difference in between the Dmitry Ivanovsky work and Bejering work, he concluded that perhaps uh, there is this contagion freedom that could exist, meaning that could go through the Chamberlain filter. But still, at that time, it wasn't really, uh, they couldn't really either uh, see the viruses. It was too small for uh, the uh, optical microscope they had at that time. So it was really, the concept of the virus didn't really came out from this work. We need to wait uh, a, a bit less than 100 years, 50 years later with the work of Wendell, Stan, uh, Wendell Stanley who was able to crystallize the MTV, the mosaic, to mosaic tobacco virus, uh, who was responsible of uh, the mold of the tobacco plants Ivanovsky and Bejerik work, worked with. 
to be able to see for the first time a virus. And at that time, uh, you had also uh, the first electron microscopy that appeared, and they were also able to see it under light micro uh, under an electronic microscope. So this is really the period of time when viruses became like something really uh, well described, and it was commonly accepted from this period of time that they were perhaps new types of pathogenic agents. And you have to wait until André Lvoff, a French scientist, uh, the, his work, to uh, see that uh, appearing the first real definition of viruses. And at that time, you had also a development in techniques such as molecular biology. Uh, it was that time where DNA wa was discovered and they, the theory that uh, DNA was uh, supporting the genetic information started to to became uh, uh, to become a dogma at that time. So basically, thanks to the development of those new techniques, Andre Andre Lvov uh, did the first, let's say, real definition of virus. Uh, he said that viruses contain only one type of nucleic acid, meaning DNA or RNA, which ca carries the viral genetic information. The second point was viruses are mandatory intracellular parasites. They depend on the host translation apparatus and its energy metabolism. And third, that viruses uh, repro reproduce directly from their genetic material by replication, making it a clear difference between bacteria that are, for instance, able of sissiparity or division. And if you read at the, the historical publication of André Lvoff about the definition of viruses, there is also this concept, you really need to, to read in between the lines, there is this concept of size, meaning that all the uh, viruses that were discovered so far were getting through the uh, Chamberlain filter. And even though André Lvoff didn't put it as a real part of the definition of viruses, the, the, the notion of uh, size did matter a lot at that time. And thanks to this definition, uh, the virology became an um, independent domain of study. At that time, you also have the first academic journal in a, in a English language that uh, was called Virology, that was only dedicated to the uh, to the what was which was focusing on uh, research about viruses that appeared, you had at the same time uh, the ICTV that started to implement an international classification and taxonomy for viruses. So this is the sixties is really the period of time where virology became, you know, an independent field of study, and you had like labs that started to uh, focus on studying. Uh, viruses and from then all the samples uh, that were used in virology were first uh, filtered through Chamberlain filter. So uh, this is if you have any question feel free. Uh, I hope I was uh, clear but the main uh, the main conclusion of this little history of virology is that first of all all the dogmas that the for instance the Miasma dogma, the core postulate, all those uh, post the, those dogmas were overthrown at some point thanks to uh, new discoveries, but also new ideas and also new uh, techniques such as electron microscopy, also um, electrophoresis did uh, allow to uh, understand, for instance, that uh, viruses were containing proteins. So you really have always this uh, dichotomy in between uh, new knowledge, new techniques, and then you see that uh, the, the, the past theory is actually either uh, never true or at least not yet false. So this is really the frame of uh, this uh, frame of great discoveries. Usually they don't pop out like this. You always have a, a, a more complex mechanism of both technical development and uh, acquisition of new knowledge. And, and did you understand co correctly, uh, protect your health 
uh, it's some promotion of some device, yes? Uh, I can see uh, protect your health on the Sorry? slide. Yes, it, it's a, yes. Uh, Google, it's yes. some promotion yes, yes. of some device, yes? Yes, but this is a really interesting question. Actually, when uh, Pasteur and Chamberlain started the work about uh, sterilization, it was because at that time they had big issues uh, with uh, poor uh, with poor quality water and uh, no antiseptic conditions for, for instance, medicine. So at that time, uh, the, the there was a, a strong political um, pressure on scientists to be able to have better living condition for people. So at the in the uh, early uh, 20, 20th century, the Pasteur, uh, the Pasteur and Chamberlain filter was a great discovery and really improved the, the health of people because it was able to filtrate water, to have sterile uh, material for... Uh, for instance, clinical examination or surgery and stuff. So yeah, yeah it was really, but it's interesting how the, how uh, government policies can implement also um, the, the, the direction of science, because for this specific example, the Chamberlain filter was really uh, something that was the society needed at that time for improving uh, uh, health conditions. Mm -hmm. Science uh, or business, business for science. Yeah, there is something like this indeed. indeed. I think, uh, Jean, uh, sorry, I think um, Jean asked you about uh, this particular uh, picture you yeah. took here. Is it is it an advertisement or something like this, or is it a scientific paper? No, no, no. no it's, it's an advertisement. Okay. And uh, okay. it's for promoting the, the Pasteur and Chamberlain filter. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Continue, Thank please. you. Ah, you're welcome. So yeah, from the fifties, we uh, from the sixties, then the 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 the, the main dogma uh, among the virologists was the definition, the strict definition of viruses uh, by Andre Lvov. And this is something we should keep in mind for the rest of the presentation. So here is another, uh, if you take here, here is another uh, Chamberlain filter. I put it a bit bigger so that everyone gets the, the mechanism. Actually, the water is going uh, through uh, this pipe. And uh, actually, this is made of porcelain. And the porcelain has really small pores of uh, inferior inferior to one micrometer. So when the water is going 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 through going through, so from uh, the sixties, you had big uh, discoveries in biology. You have, for instance, uh, the HIV, who, which was discovered in the nineties and stuff, and now I uh, will look back at uh, we will look back at an event that uh, occurred in uh, 1987 in an English hospital in Bradford. Uh, at that time, in this hospital, uh, they had a big um, a pneumonia, pneumonia outbreak, and the doctor Tim Robot Robotam. Uh, decided to investigate the reason why they had such an epidemic uh, outbreak in this hospital, looking for intracellular bacteria that are infecting these types of amoebas. Uh, Chinese again? Sorry? I said Chinese again. <laughs> no, it's not Chinese virus. <laughs> not this time. Uh, and uh, Tim Robotam discovered th this specific amoeba with some intracellular parasites. And at this time, he thought, OK, that might be bacteria, because usually amoebas are infected with uh, bacteria that are responsible uh, for um, pneumonia that are pa um, opportunistic pathogens. And he was like, OK, I might have found the, the, the pathogenic agent of this pneumonia outbreak. 
but actually he never uh, he was never he has never been able to cultivate these intracellular parasites and he did some gram staining and he saw okay this is a gram positive coxy it looks like a gram positive coxy but not cultivable and from then no one has ever been able to characterize this uh, endoplasmic uh, parasite that he discovered in this Acantamoeba castellani uh, isolate. And we have to wait until 2004, thanks to the collaboration in between the IGS, my, my lab, and the Professor Raoult at the ESU of Marseille, that said, okay, if no one can you know, cultivate and describe and characterize this pathogenic agent. Let's have a look at it more precisely using um, electron microscopy. And when they looked at the endoparasite through electron uh, micrographs, they, they really saw something that was really definitely looking like a virus. You have this icosahedral capsid, but the thing is it was some uh, such a big capsid particle that uh, no one believed at that time that was ac this was actually a virus that could be as big as a bacteria that uh, they really didn't uh, accept that the scientific community really did not accept this this fact that perhaps we discovered a virus that was as big as bacteria so uh, we had to sequence the genome of this parasite to prove that it had some capsid genes and also all the metabolic um, pathway for DNA um, replication and RNA expression, to prove that actually the, geno the gene content of this endoparasite was fitting with the, dis the, the definition of, of, of VOF of viruses, meaning that uh, it's somehow also we can say it's it's perhaps the first uh, virus that was described as a virus using uh, some uh, sequencing uh, data. Uh, if you have any question, again, feel free to 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 ask. So, at that time. Uh, all the viruses were really, uh, it was really the, the biggest uh, virus ever discovered. And uh, also the gene content was really, really impressive because you have, you had about thousand genes uh, encoded by Mimi virus, as you can see here. And more interestingly, you had like uh, about 60% of the genes that were called orphans because they had no homologues at that time in the public databases, meaning that none of those genes were uh, looking like anything known at that time. Since the discovery of minivirus, uh, a lot of different other families were discovered. As I told you in the beginning of my presentation, you have now five uh, main families of giant viruses, meaning that they could be uh, seen under light microscopy. And here is, for instance, Marseille uh, virus, which is a small uh, icosahedral uh, uh, particle shaped virus. You have megavirus, it's part of the Mimi virus, uh, Mimi viride family, which is they're looking like Mimi virus. And uh, more recently, we had the Pandora virus here that has been discovered, which was a big surprise because it's even bigger than Mimi virus. And the discovery of uh, Pandora virus uh, put the, was uh, put, breaking the, bury, the, the frontier of a particle size even further. And in 2015, we were able to reactivate from permafrost samples from Pleistocene two new uh, giant virus uh, that was never been observed so far, which are molivirus and pitovirus. And pitovirus is an actually now the biggest virus, virus ever uh, discovered with a size of 1.5 micrometer uh, diameter. 
And now if you look at the, this little phylogeny based on the uh, DNA polymerases, uh, the subunit B of the DNA polymerase, you can see that they're all clustering together along with all the types of double-stranded uh, viruses. You have, for instance, uh, what we call the... Uh, you have herpes viruses here, you have also pox viruses, you have ascoviridae, you have all the, what we call the NCLDV, but I won't uh, talk much about it uh, during my presentation, but this is just to show you the phylogeny of those giant viruses. So here you have the Minoviridae, the Pitoviridae, the Marseilleviridae, the Molivirus Pindaricum, and the Pandora. Uh, Jean, sorry. Hello? Yes. Hello? Uh -huh. yes. Uh, what about this cafeteria, Roenberg Gensis virus? Is it um, considered a giant virus or no? Uh, which one? A cafeteria, Roenberg Gensis. Right. So, well, that's a, a good question. Actually, um, all those dying viruses were studying at the lab, the one I showed you the pictures of, they're all infective, infecting Acantamoeba castellani. They are, they are all infective, infecting amoebas. But indeed, you have uh, now uh, viruses that are uh, clustering, if you do phylogeny with uh, mimi viruses including uh, Cafetaria roevergensis virus. And they're now part of a big family called, called the Mimiviridae, which encompasses indeed Mimivirus and all Megavirus, Mumuvirus, Mamavirus that are infecting Cantamoeba castellani, and also some uh, different types of Mimiviridae that are slightly uh, smaller in size and are infecting uh, uh, algae. Indeed. So it's not really considered as a real giant virus, meaning it's difficult to see it under a light microscope. But if you look at the genomic level, then it clusters indeed with the Mimiviridae. Okay, thanks. And uh, just another small question. What about this term, giant virus? Is it uh, considered a kind of jargon in English and in, in France? Or you use it like a term to, to group? those viruses. Is it okay to, to put it in the paper, for example? Uh, yes, 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 of course. And there is actually a um, kind of debate about the term giant viruses, because um, to, at least to, to, in the opinion in my lab would be to say, okay, giant viruses are only viruses that can be seen under light microscope meaning all those cafetaria roebergensis, etc., etc., oreococcus, uh, all this uh, clad here shouldn't be considered as giant viruses, even though they're clustering with Mimiviridae. So to us, it's a very strict definition. Giant viruses means that the particle size is bigger than uh, 300 nanometer. Okay. That's why actually we're only working on, on those five families here, because they are the st strictly considered giant viruses. Because they're bigger. Marseille virus is, I should have put some uh, light microscopic uh, picture of Marseille virus. It's really difficult to see it, but still you can see it. It's really obvious. I put later on on my presentation a picture of Molivirus under light microscope. And I will show you it's really, really big enough to be seen under a uh, light microscope. I don't know if I really uh, answered your question, but... Uh... Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I, I don't understand this opinion and uh, in a whole, but I think it's a discussion part. Uh, let's proceed. On. All right. And I, I have one question. Uh, so we can we can see the phylogeny uh, tree, phylogeny tree, and then uh, the uh, phylogeny was done by sequence of some genes. Yes. Yes, the subunit B of the DNA polymerase. 
at the end okay mm -hmm. thank you and uh, uh, all right so let's move on and what is really interesting is it's that uh, they all have also not only a big capsid but a, a big a big genome size for instance if you take uh, molivirus and pitovirus the genome size is about a bit more than a half megabase 0.6 megabases. If you take the Mimi Verde, it's 1.2 megabases. And if you take the Pandora uh, viruses, it's even bigger than two and a half megabases. Meaning that now, if you on this plot, what you can see is if you put all the genome size of different types of archaea, bacteria, and even eukaryotes, you have a kind of continuum in between. Meaning that perhaps here, we still need to find some more giant viruses that will complete this continuum. Blurring the line in between uh, the three domains of life and the place of viruses in uh, this frame. So now uh, I will just... Uh, to sorry, Jean, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, about this picture. What is the X? Uh, X? Uh, X. <laughs> the X X <laughs> X ah, uh, genome size genome size it's written in French I'm sorry I didn't yeah, that's, use that's it. Y, y and what is on the X, X. Uh, ah all right this is just um, uh, there is no it's just that I ranked it like for instance here ah I just I, rank it from the smaller yes, to the bigger okay yes, okay yes, thanks. Yes. From the smallest to the bigger. Okay. So I wanted to talk a bit more about Pandora viruses. The, the first Pandora virus was discovered in 2013. From uh, it was recovered from uh, pond, pond water from Australia. And uh, if you uh, have a look at the particle under light microscope, uh, what you can see is that uh, they're about 1 to 1.5 micrometer long. As you can see on the uh, top picture. And what was really interesting is that they had this amphora shape. That's why they were actually called uh, Pandora viruses. Because in the Greek mythology, uh, the Pandora box was actually a jar that was amphora shaped, such as this virus. And if you look at uh, the. Uh, wait a minute, I have a connection issue. Up, up, up. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, if you look at the. Um, Gene content, as I told you, it is encoded. It's the, the genome size is about uh, two to two point five megabases, which is super huge for uh, viruses, and um, it encodes about uh, two thousand five hundred genes, including eighty four percent. You have here the number of orphans, uh, meaning the genes without any homologs in the databases, which is uh, meaning uh, uh, two about <laughs> two thousand. Uh, new genes with potential new functions and even uh, proteins with uh, new foldings that were never discovered since we can't find any homologs in the databases. And if you look at the uh, wall, uh, the capsid structure here, ABC, there is this really interesting thing is that you have here A, a really thick and electron dense uh, layer on the capsid that looks like uh, it, it, it seems like it's um, uh, striated, like ribbed. And you will see on the rest of the presentation why I, I, I'm po pointing this detail uh, now. Uh, if you look here now, since the discovery of the first Pandora virus, we have discovered uh, quite a big number of new Pandora viruses. Uh, and you have now two clades of Pandora viruses, clade A, clade B. And 
the first interesting things that was discovered a few years ago in 2018 is that here, if you look at the palm genome, it looks like it's never closed. A, while the uh, core gene set looks like it's already closed, meaning we have enough number of genomes to close the core genome, but apparently the pan genome is still open. So that was a really intri intriguing point. So Mathieu Lejeune, which is my co-thesis uh, director, wanted to investigate a bit more uh, the reasons uh, why this pan genome was still open while the core gene set was closed. So he took those orphan genes and he computed some, uh, he performed some analysis on those genes, including the codon adaptation index, meaning uh, you take a reference, here we took as a reference uh, the gene set of the host of Acantamoeba castellani, and you compare the codon usage in between the, the, the reference and your genome. Meaning the more the value is uh, uh, closer to one, the best, the, the, the same codon, both genes, both genomes, both species are using. And if you uh, take the core gene set, you have a codon adaptation usage about uh, 0.35. And if you take those ORF, then the codon usage is really different from the rest of the genes. If you look now at the GC percent, again, those orphans, some of them looks like they have a GC percent closer to the intergenic region than from the rest of the genome. They have really a different GC percent and also they look smaller. So that was the first uh, clue that led Mathieu and the rest of the lab to say, okay, perhaps Pandora viruses are able to, from the intergenic region to create some new gen genes. This theory was um, uh, then uh, further uh, uh, investigated uh, using a trans transcriptomic approach. And apparently, uh, in Pandora viruses, you have really a lot of long, long non-coding RNA that could be also a clue about uh, the, that also be the testimony of uh, de novo gene curation processes ongoing in the Pandora virus. Sorry, Eugene, sorry. Uh, this RNA is produced inside the cell. I can't remember the cell, right? So you don't yes. have it. Yes. These are DNA viruses. Yes, yes, double-stranded DNA viruses. Okay, so where, where do you have this RNA? No, uh, well, actually, you have it expressed during the infectious cycle. Okay. And, infectious and when you Yes, and when you map those long non-coding RNA on the genome, it appears that they fit with intergenic regions. Okay, okay, thanks. So, uh, the conclusion was, uh, at, uh, in, we published the paper in 2018, and I'm part of this paper for small work I did from the, this paper on Pandora viruses. The, 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 the main, uh, the, our theory was from the intergenic region, you have the gain of um, a start codon, then you have uh, tra um, transcription, reason why we have non-coding RNA, and then you have acquisition of the stop, and then you have the uh, a protein that is expressed. So from the intergenic region, you have uh, acquisition of translation and then expression and then refinement for protein function. That's what the, the, the most parsimonious theory exp explaining why some of those uh, orf, orphan genes are smaller uh, with a GC percent closer to the intergenic region than from the genic region and why they have a codon usage re which is way more different than the rest of the genome. And uh, what is the job of the um, orphan gene, or protein from the genes? 
Well, uh, what it's is the job? Really interesting. Unique, unique function, maybe. Yes, that was a that's that's a big question because most uh, of um, if you if you statistically if you express uh, random uh, pieces of intergenic region which are more AT rich usually eight more AT rich than the coding regions you have disordered proteins because the um, the codons that are AT rich are uh, coding usually for amino acids that are responsible for disordering proteins. So it's really difficult to either express those orphan genes and to uh, be able to uh, crystallize it and describe the proteins that are encoded and to uh, find the, the, the perhaps new uh, metabolic pathways that are uh, supported by the expression of those genes. I, I see, thank you. But uh, that would be really interesting to have uh, indeed a, a better clue because when you have like 2,000 genes that have no homologues anywhere and even the, the proteins encoded uh, are uh, have no known uh, domains, it's really it's really fascinating. You indeed you can find really new functions. It's but it's a uh, uh, whole life uh, job. Okay, so uh, now I will focus a little bit more on uh, moly viruses, which are really the viruses I studied during my thesis. And uh, I will talk to you first, uh, talk to you about moly virus uh, Sibericum first, and then we'll go to Kamchatka. So moly virus, uh, Ah, what the... Okay, you shouldn't read... I, I removed this on the... Uh, this isn't... Okay, don't look at this. <laughs> this is part of an old, of the, uh, I used the same frame for a, a former presentation about astrology, so <laughs> this is something else. But anyway... Um, and in 2015, uh, the lab was looking for a new uh, environment to explore in order to find new uh, giant viruses families. And uh, Jean-Michel Clavry starting, started reading the Russian literature about reactivation of both bacteria and eukaryotes from um, permafrost samples, from the uh, 30,000 years old permafrost samples from Pleistocene. And he concluded, okay, so if the permafrost is able to uh, preserve uh, some infectious bacteria or some plants, perhaps it can also uh, preserve some viruses that can still be infectious after uh, thousands of years trapped in the permafrost. So this is how the collaboration between Pushino and our lab started. And we basically uh, run some reactivation uh, protocols. Uh, Stas, when he was uh, in our lab, uh, was able to uh, witness the way we do it. We just basically, it's a bit like magic trick. We put uh, some samples directly on amoebas. And after a few days of cultivation, we look through uh, uh, optic microscope. And if we are lucky enough, we can find out some of the amoebas, such as this amoeba contact Mueva Castellani, that looks like it has some parasites inside. I don't know if you see it properly. Uh, yes, probably. Like this dot here? This one? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. It's like a tick. Yeah. And uh, whenever we see this type of uh, endoparasite, as well as some specific phenotypic features of the amoeba, like they turn really round and sometimes they don't stick to the, um, to the flask anymore, we suppose that there is a viral infection ongoing on the flask and we transplant it until we produce uh, 
enough virus so that we can perform our further analysis. So this is why uh, we call these giant viruses because you can, as you can see, uh, they can be seen under light microscope. And uh, and uh, if uh, you are able to uh, retrieve some viruses such as this moly virus here, the f one of the first experiments you run is some uh, electron microscopy to be able to see properly the shape of the particle of the capsid. And at that time, when we did the first inclusion of Molivirus uh, sibericum, this is what we saw. A spherical particle, which is about uh, 650 nanometer in diameter. And if you look at the capsid structure, it has exactly the same um, ribbed, thick and electron dense layer than the one I showed you for the Conora viruses. And this was really an, an intriguing question because uh, this has never been uh, seen, a capsid with, with such uh, with such an electron dense uh, layer. So, uh, we described also the replication cycle of molivirus using electron microscopy. And I will introduce you to this uh, nine hour long uh, replication cycle, which starts with the phagocytosis of uh, the virions, the virus. Uh, it has not been proven, proven yet that it's phagocytosis but since the amoeba is feeding on bacteria that are about the same size of those viruses and they're absorbed by phagocytosis by the amoeba, we concluded that most probably the amoeba might uh, not distinguish those giant viruses and the bacteria they're feeding on so that they just basically uh, absorb them through phagocytosis just as they're feeding on bacteria. Then you have um, the particle, uh, the viral particle that are an, um, in uh, phagosomes. And then you have the translocation through a channel between the cytoplasm and this, uh, the fusion of the phagosome membrane and the inner uh, membrane of the particle. You have this channel that allows the viral DNA to go from the cytoplasm directly to the nucleus, where you have the replication and the early transcription of uh, the viral machinery, including the RNA polymerase and the DNA polymerase. Then you have translation again in the cytoplasm, and then you have what we called a viral factory that takes place in the host cell. Here is a picture of a viral factory. You have these fibrils that are, uh, I don't know if you see them properly, but you have fibrils in the middle of the viral factory. And in this uh, viral factory, you have an exclusion of all the organelles of the cells, including mitochondria that you can see here on the periphery of the viral factory, you have an intense membrane recycling. Here you see some membranes, you see some membranes here. You see here some nuclear membranes, you see here the nuclear pores. And in this uh, viral factory, you have the assembly of new uh, viral particles at different stages of maturation. And then you have exocytosis of those uh, mature particles uh, about nine hours after the infection. Do you have any question about the, uh, am I clear enough? I don't know. Yes, I, I have one question. Um, yes. The membrane of nucleus uh, has some specific channel to for for DNA of virus or or not specific channel. 
Ah, uh, this I don't know. The, the 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 only thing I can tell you is that you have an eclipse phase, meaning between uh, five to seven uh, to five to six hours post infection, you don't see much viruses in the cells. They're like the 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 the, the capsid is most probably digested by the phagosome, and and the the the, the early transcription that occurs in the nucleus makes uh what we call the eclipse phase meaning that you don't have uh, uh viruses in the cytoplasm and you have early transcription of the dna virus the viral dna and then you have the assembly of new variants that takes about six to seven hours to occur to have the viral factory that takes place into the 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 cytoplasm and and the the cell is going to die after the infection. Well, this is really in interesting question. Uh, about thirty percent of the cells, the nucleus explodes. Like for instance, this one, you see that this is uh, some uh, cell nucleus membrane recycling, meaning the the the, the nucleus has exploded. But I can show you a picture that I put here, uh, wait just a minute, I will uh, up. up, you see all those membranes here and you have nuclear membranes here, uh, is, do, is everyone seeing the picture? Yes, uh, yes, yes, okay. All those here are uh, cell debris from the nuclear membrane. So for 30% of the of the cells, you have a rupture of the nuclear membrane, meaning that from this time, the cell is actually not uh, able to, to, to basically do anything, actually. Uh, the, 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 the. I will show you another picture of the infectious cycle. Up. You see here a uh, rupture of the mm -hmm. set. Uh, so it's pretty obvious that, and here you can see that you don't see the nucleus properly anyway uh, anymore. Mm -hmm. And may I ask a question? Yeah, sure, sure. <clears throat> uh, and are these uh, viruses uh, specific for amoebas, or they could uh, attack any other organism? No, no, those viruses are, uh, so far, we only know uh, they can infect uh, Acontamoeba uh, species. It has never been reported that giant viruses could infect other types of cells. Uh, and uh, in evolution, giant viruses are precursors of other viruses. Uh, the way is to simple, uh, uh, simple form, uh, small form, or giant viruses now we can uh, find anywhere. Well, you can find, uh, since, you, uh, well, actually, uh, you can find amoebas anywhere. Most un, or in most environments, including even uh, water, like sea water. So we concluded that most probably you can find uh, giant viruses in all the environments where there are amoebas. If it's the question, I th did I answer the question? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, do you think that uh, giantism uh, is uh, the first uh, step in evolution, and then the viruses uh, become smaller during the evolution. Or oh, okay. yeah. Yes, uh, it's a really interesting question. Well, actually, I, I, I think there is a, a, the, the answer might be in between reductionism and expansionism. Because, for instance, if you look at the orphan genes, all those genes mm -hmm. that have no homologues, they're still there, mm -hmm. which is really questioning the, 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 the reductionist uh, theory. Why keeping all those genes? 
On the other hand, if you consider the, the expansionist theory of evolution, uh, it makes not much sense to uh, acquire some new genes to create some new genes without any known functions. So the main theory in the lab would be that since some giant, uh, well, if you take, for instance, Mimi virus, uh, it has been discovered that Mimi virus is able to code for part of the uh, translation machinery. Some uh, translation of some uh, tRNA, uh, ah, Sorry, my English is bad, sorry. Uh, I have difficulties speaking in English uh, today. Um, some of the translation apparatus is encoded by Mimi virus, meaning perhaps the theory uh, in between expansionism and reductionism is that at some point, RNA cells were infected by giant viruses, giving them the first nucleus. And then uh, giant viruses turn back to pure parasitism in at some point of evolution. Mm. Okay. And, this is the, and perhaps this was even before the uh, the Lucas, uh, uh, the, the um, um, common ancestors of all eukaryotes. Perhaps this this those viruses were able to infect cells line that lost the. Um, um, evolution race with Lucas. That could be also a theory. Mm -hmm. uh, just a moment. Uh, I have a small note. Notice. I will put here uh, in this uh, Jean's channel and probably in the common chat uh, two presentations by Jean Michel, uh, the, the chief of Jean. Uh, one of which uh, he gave here in Pushin and one somewhere else, uh, where he concerns this, this question a lot, uh, because it, it, it's, it's a vague topic and it's very interesting. Uh, are those giant viruses are precursors or vice versa, uh, the uh, descendants of, of uh, normal, let's say normal viruses? So it's a, it's a big, really big challenge, I would say, right, Eugene? Yes, yes, yes. I, and I'm sorry I didn't uh, put any slide about this and I didn't prepare a speech about no, this. It's, but it's, it's okay, because it would be really long talk. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, yes. But, uh, and also because there are lo there is a huge fight in between different theories at the moment. So I'm not really into getting a fight with... Uh, uh, Eugene Kunin or, the, or Patrick Forte, which are big guys, you know, in, uh, yeah, in right. science. <laughs> I'd rather stick to what uh, Jean-Michel and Chantal say. Okay. So did I did I partly yeah. answer the question, uh, Phil? Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay. So let's uh, So yeah, another part of my PhD work was about uh, studying the um, assembly of the um, capsid of Molivirus sibiricum. So we use several techniques such as cryo microscopy, uh, regular uh, transmission uh, electron microscopy, as well as uh, some a bit more sophisticated techniques like uh, focused ion beam uh, tomography, which I didn't use, but our collaborators in the uh, Institut Pasteur of Paris did. And uh, I will describe you now the assembly process that occurs at that stage of the infectious cycle. So you have basically uh, three stages. The first is called the viral, cre uh, the, the, it's the beginning of the assembly. You have here uh, three colors that corresponds to uh, here the colors of the model. You have um, 
uh, round, a circular uh, membrane structure that initiates the recruitment of those vesicles here that are uh, spherical vesicles at the beginning. And when they touch the assembly site here, for instance, they got cleaner. And then they contribute to the formation of the inner membrane of the virion. And from this flat pole here, in orange, there is also the synthesis of this thick layer I showed you previously. So this is how the assembly begins. You have the inner content of the virus that is also um, getting uh, assembled. Then you have the second phase, with, phase which is called the uh, viral crescent, when you have most probably a vesicle uh, coming from the recycling of the reticulum of the host cell that seems to be pushing the inner material of the particle inside the neosynthetized virion, and you still have this initiation vesicle that keeps on uh, both recruiting some uh, membrane uh, vesicles as well as synthesizing this uh, thick, dense uh, layer. And then you have the uh, closure of the uh, virion where, where uh, the DNA is loaded in, into uh, the neosynthetized uh, virus. And using uh, some click methods, which is uh, basically uh, uh, making the viral DNA fluorescent, we were able to characterize those uh, fibers are uh, as a mixture between proteins and viral DNA. And this is those fibers that are uh, loaded in the particle at the end of the assembly. This is just to show you quickly uh, the the uh, focused ion beam tomography uh, we were able able to acquire. And as I was uh, telling you before, the viral factory, which is really concentrating all the metabolic activity that of the virus that has hijacked the cell host machinery, and it's really excluding all the mitochondria here in yellow and all the organelles of the cell. And you have here the different stages of uh, particle assembly, the matter variance, the viral correction, which is the different phases I told you, the membrane precursor is the first uh, um, phase. You have the viral correction and the closure of the period. If you look now at the on the genomic level, you have uh, about 480 genes that are encoded by um, Molivirus sibiricum, of which uh, about uh, three fourths of the genes are uh, orphans. I did during my PhD uh, reannotation of the of the genes of the genome, sorry, and uh, I detail you here the process. We are using uh, two types of uh, DNA sequencing methods to uh, sequence our viruses. First, we use uh, Illumina uh, short read pair end uh, read sequencing methods, as well as uh, long read sequencing methods like mini ion. And we use both of the reads that are produced by those two techniques to make the assembly. And when the so here, we're using spades, we're running the assembly. And for Molivirus uh, sibiricum, we also have RNA, RNA sequencing data. And this is really helpful to uh, uh, annotate the genes. For instance, I have exons and introns, because without RNA sequencing data, it's difficult to predict the introns. We use a set of different annotation uh, softwares, including Breaker that uses RNA sequencing data, Augustus Gene Mark and Getorf for the um, ab initio uh, annotation of the assembly, and then we use Evidence Modeler, which is which is EVM, which is um, um, 
a program that uh, balances the different prediction of genes uh, by those different softwares and makes the best model. And then we upload all those predictions, including all those for here and the synthesis of those uh, software we're using evidence modeler. We put them on a web server that is called Web Apollo, and you do some uh, manual curation, meaning you look at each um, prediction, you, you look manually if it fits with the error sequencing data, and if you can uh, see if, for instance, evidence model has done some errors in the annotation. I put this because uh, I put this part of the slide because uh, if you also want to discuss about methods we're using, it's feel free to to have to ask me any question. If you even need the, ver the versions of those different uh, softwares, I can give you. So this is everything I've done on Molivirus Sibiricum. And uh, at the, in the middle of my thesis, I received some uh, samples, cryosol samples from Kamchatka, from uh, uh, a friend of Jean-Michel, actually, who is a kind of uh, sponsor of our lab, but he does it for, for free and for because he loves Kamchatka, actually. So he scooped some uh, samples from uh, the Kronoski uh, River, which is down the volcano of uh, the Kronoski volcano. And we received the sample. Sample. Here is the region where it was scooped. The sample was uh, retrieved. And this is where, uh, of, of course, you know better than me this place, because it, it's the, the where is the Pushino lab. Uh, ex not lab, sorry, um, a base. And uh, so it's really far away, uh, the, the spot where we retrieve the second molivirus. Meaning that uh, moliviruses can be found in really different environments. And I'm not going to to explain you how different is Kamchatka from uh, the Eastern Siberia region, but that proves that uh, first uh, moliviruses can be found in really diverse environments and as well as in recent samples, meaning that moliviruses didn't, didn't disappear during Pleistocene. There's still, it's still a, an ongoing family of giant viruses. So here is the first picture I took of Molivirus Kamchatka. It really resembles the Molivirus Sibiricum. There is no difference in the replication cycle. There is no difference in the virion assembly process. But what is interesting if it's when you look at the genome. So here we had a different technical approach. We have no RNA sequencing data from Molivirus Kamchatka. So what we did to seek to uh, assemble and annotate the genome is slightly different than what we did for uh, Molivirus Sibiricum. We used the assembly of Molivirus Sibiricum, all the whole ORFs that were uh, annotated for Molivirus Sibiricum. And we trained Augustus, which uh, is a program I all, that can do ab initio uh, annotation, but also can train itself on uh, close relatives to the species you're studying, meaning that uh, Molivirus Sibiricum and Molivirus Kamchatka were close enough to train Augustus on the prediction of genes of Molivirus Sibiricum. And I also use Exonerate, which takes all the ORFs and try to match the sequences in the genome you're trying to annotate ab initio. Again, same sequencing methods to uh, sequence the virus, both Illumina and long read nanopore. Spades, again, same assembl assembler uh, software and uh, a slightly different ab initio uh, prediction process, again, uh, evidence modeler afterwards that uh, balances all the prediction and tries to have the best model and then this uh, manual uh, step of checking each gene. Uh, Jean, uh, why did you uh, use uh, the yeah. initial prediction? Uh, I mean you can, could just map uh, this genome to the previous molivirus, uh, genome, probably. 
Uh, I didn't uh, I didn't hear you well, uh, Stas. Uh -huh. um, so my question was, uh, why did you use uh, the ab initial prediction uh, ah. instead of instead of just mapping uh, new read to the molevirus cytokine genome? We did it actually. We did both uh, approaches. The one you're describing is indeed the the the, the one using exoneric, which takes what the the, the all the ORFs that are predicting molivirus sibiricum and try to match these against to match it against the genome of molivirus Kamchatka. So basically, if we have an homologue of one protein of molivirus sibiricum in molivirus Kamchatka, this will help finding it. Uh -huh, okay. Thanks. Augustus is uh, has a it's a package of softwares that includes. Um, uh, that you can, uh, you can actually train uh, the, uh, the software to uh, annotate uh, genomes using uh, close relatives to the genome you're actually uh, annotating ab initio. So these two steps here, those two steps here, are actually this, they are actually fitting with what you're uh, proposing with the why we and also because uh, gene mark is interesting because it has the you can add, add the option to detect introns ab initio. Yes, yes, yes thanks. Yes, thanks. Go on, please. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yes, and if we compare the genome, here on the dot plot, you can see that they're really collinear. That's why we used Exonerate and Augustus without any question, because the both genomes were really collinear. Opa, okay. So, sorry, this is a little mistake, sorry. So, I don't know why this is here, anyway. So, this is the comparison data. You have on one side Molivirus Sibericum, which is about 0 0.65 megabases, while Molivirus Kamchatka is slightly shorter. Same GC percent, about 60%. If you take the average uh, I nucleotide identity, it's really high, they're really close relatives. You have 495 uh, proteins that are predicted for Molivirus Sibericum and uh, 480 for Molivirus Kamchatka. You have a first draft of the core gene set that is about 511 proteins, meaning that they both encode uh, mostly for the same proteins. And those proteins have uh, average identity uh, of 92%. And they both have 60% or fans, of which 33 and 20 are unique uh, proteins of each virus. And uh, they have 20, Molivirus Sibiricum has 26 orphan that is not, that are not found in Molivirus Kamchatka, and 12 uh, uh, genes of Molivirus Kamchatka are not find, found in either the public databases or in Molivirus Sibiricum, meaning those 26 genes for Molivirus Sibiricum and 12 genes for Molivirus Kamchatka must have appeared from somewhere because uh, they're specific, they're orphan specific to each strain. And uh, those proteins, uh, are they, they are, um, in silico prediction or are you really purified and characterized them? Oh. Well, actually, uh, for Molivirus Sibericum, you have the transcriptomic data. So they're most probably real proteins. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, for Kamchatka, you did, uh, did you do transcriptomic yet? Right? For Kamchatka, since we trained the program Augustus for detecting uh -huh. genes based on the gene content uh, of Molivirus. Transcripts of, of Sibericum, okay. 
Yes. And uh, so most probably there are real proteins. I see. Mm -hmm. But indeed without any uh, uh, transcriptomic data, it's difficult to be 100% sure. That's true. Okay. Uh, Jean, just a maybe short answer on uh, how do you distinguish uh, species in viruses? Why, why do you... Uh, just in a few words, please, because it's uh, also very discussed, uh, I imagine. Uh, how, how do you... Why do you say it's a different species? <laughs> mm. Well, that's a good question, because... Uh, most probably, be, I don't have a clear answer. I, I would say that because the, you mean a species of virus, like how do you distinguish between Pandora virus and molivirus, for instance, or in between two uh, molyviruses? Yeah, yeah, sure, and two molyviruses, because the different morphology yeah. and so on, it's, it's different. But here, it looks pretty similar by synteny plot or something mm. like that. It's a really good question because if you consider the average nucleotide identity, for instance, I, I know that the standard for bacteria is that whenever you, you, you are uh, less than 97% uh, 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 identity in between the two genomes, you consider it a new species, right? Probably, but there are a lot of discussion also. Yeah. And for viruses, I think the question is not actually uh, currently a, a huge topic because, uh, you know, uh, there is this concept that uh, viruses are uh, fast evolving. For instance, if you take the flu from one year to another, they are really divergent because the genome size is really small and um, fast evolving. And uh, so there is no okay. clear... So uh, is am no I right? Am I right? I, I will generalize a bit, but am I right that uh, to describe a new species of virus, you just need to prove that it is different from all previously found ones. Kind of, <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. No, no, that, that, but to me that would be the best answer. I don't know if it's the standard uh, <laughs> answer you can find. Yeah, there. yeah, sure, sure. Uh, of course, it's, it's a, partly it's a joke, and I said it's, uh, it should be a great discussion. I'm not a biologist, yeah. but I, I can imagine. But uh, is this a practice? I mean, I mean, how how do you do this? You virologists do this, okay? Let's go on. Thank you. <laughs> the answer is we don't really do. We don't really have standards for this. Action. We don't really care. Oh, sorry. Kind of, kind of, kind of. Especially here, what is interesting is not really the differences in terms of identity and conservation. It's more that they are they are both. Uh, 30,000 years old in between, you know. So, I put here an, an arm. I don't know why this is not supposed to be. Anyway. Um, uh, so, here I describe you how we did the uh, functional annotation, meaning we're how we try to find out the function of the different proteins encoded by the genes of both viruses. So we take all the predicted proteins here. We use both hash hash bits and interposcan uh, softwares. And then we check on Excel manually if the prediction of hash hash bits is fitting with interposcan or not. And if the domain predicted by interposcan fits, with the prediction of the HMM profile provided by HHBits, then we annotate it uh, as functional protein. And here is the, if the domain is complete, meaning both uh, predictions are fitting, we call them complete. And if Interpostcan uh, predicts a partial domain that is found also by HHBits as the protein function, we annotate it incomplete. But this is manual process, so that we're sure about what we are predicting, uh, predicting and what we're not predicting. And it was really interesting because in both moliviruses, uh, the first uh, protein that drive, uh, drove our attention was that uh, molivirus is encoding a major capsid protein. 
and the major capsid protein with its, with its um, beta barrel jelly fold is supposed to give a, a icosahedrical uh, symmetry to the capsid, which is obviously not the case since the particle is round. So that was a big question. And also, when you look at both Pandora viruses and moliviruses, you say, okay, the, 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 the structure of the capsid really looks like each other. But on one hand, moliviruses expresses the major capsid protein, while Pandora viruses appears to have uh, lost it. So there is at some point in evolution a big question about how you turn from icosahedrical uh, particle shape to either rounds and then M4 shape particle, losing the MCP. So that was a big interesting question. And uh, in both moliviruses, you find the usual uh, DNA expression and uh, transcription apparatus, including RNA polymerase, uh, polyadenylation proteins, etc., etc. Uh, okay, so I'm sorry for this. So, yeah, okay, I understand. It was supposed to be an animation, but I don't know why, uh, why it didn't work. So anyway, uh, taking advantages uh, of uh, the, core, the first draft of the core gene set we, we did, we tried uh, and the high average uh, amino acid identity in between those different genes. We tried to compute the selection pressure applied on most of the genome. And when we compute the omega value, also called uh, DNDS, which is the variation of non-synonymous uh, uh, mutation over synonymous mutation on a set of homolog proteins, it appears that uh, most of the genome is under purifying selection, meaning that over the 30,000 years old, in between the two strains, not much has uh, evolved in terms of uh, uh, mutations, meaning that most probably uh, all the genome is, um, is strictly necessary to the virus uh, for surviving. Then if we compute, thanks to all the sequencing uh, data we have on Podora viruses and moliviruses, we try to uh, dig a bit further in the possibility of a common ancestry between those two giant virus family. And it appears that actually, if you took, take the core gene set of all Pandora viruses and the core gene, core gene set of the, both moliviruses, actually both families share about a fourth of their core gene set. And if you look at the selection pressure on this uh, super core gene set, which is here, here you have the selection pressure applied on the core genome of uh, moliviruses, here on Pandora viruses, and you can see that those 90 uh, gene clusters are even under uh, uh, more stringent negative selection pressure, meaning that those uh, 90 core genes uh, clusters, they might be really important for both families. Meaning that if you take both um, morphological uh, uh, similarities between the two capsids of both uh, viruses and the gene content, it really uh, points out that you have a past common ancestry between uh, both Pandora viruses and moliviruses. Then we looked at all those uh, genes I told you that were specific to both uh, viruses and had no homologs in the databases, meaning the orphan that are strictly corresponding to either Molivirus Kamchatka or Molivirus Sibiricum. And what we can see, as for Pandora viruses, they have a shorter, uh, uh, they are shorter indeed in length, they are short proteins. They're also uh, having a GC percent that is closer to the intergenic region and really different from the genic regions of those two uh, for the, both viruses. And also, if you look at the codon usage, it's really different from the codon usage of others, uh, of others prote other proteins that are encoded by both viruses, meaning those uh, 
orphans strict to one uh, strain might be actually uh, the testimony of a uh, gene creation de novo process that is ongoing in moliviruses as well as in Pandora viruses. So this is another common feature between those two families of giant uh, viruses. And now something that has uh, very uh, poorly investigated and that we discovered as something really, really, really uh, surprising in both moliviruses is the distribution of genes along the genome. If you take, for instance, all the uh, uh, genes of molivirus cybericum that express a protein that has an homologous sequence in the host, Acantamoeba castellani, they look like they're randomly distributed along the genome. But if you take all those orphans uh, that are strict to uh, molivirus sibericum, you see that they're mostly found on the uh, first part of the genome, while the core gene set that is shared between both Pandora viruses and moliviruses seems to be present predominantly on the other side of the genome. And if you look at uh, the position of uh, parallel genes and single copy genes along the genome, you can see that single copy genes are found, are, uh, are randomly distributed along the genome, while parallel seems to accumulate on the first half of the genome. So if you consider that, the, as described previously in this presentation, the orphans that are strict to, for instance, molivirus sibericum are mostly found one part of the genome, meaning that the creation, uh, gene creation process occurs mainly here, as well as uh, the duplication events, since all paralogs are mostly found in the same half of the genome. So this uh, led us to hypothesize that perhaps for re unknown reason so far, uh, the first half of the genome of molivirus, which is linear, so there is no problem about saying the first half, uh, seems to accumulate uh, all the ge genomic so-called creativity, including gene creation and duplication, on one part of the genome, while the other part might be more consistent with a, a, uh, 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 with all the uh, conserved um, uh, genes in between uh, Pandora viruses and moliviruses, meaning you have on one side the creativity and on the other side the conservation. So here's the conclusion of the work I did on moliviruses during my PhD, that most probably the moliviridae can be proposed as the, a new family of giant viruses because they have those specific features that are distinguishing them between uh, with Pandora viruses, including the expression of a major capsid protein. But on the other on, on the other hand, it really appears that they have a common past ancestry since they're sharing about a fourth of their core gene set, as well as uh, structural similarities in their capsid. Here is the last slide that uh, we'll uh, present you. I'm sorry, it's uh, in French because it's uh, from a presentation of Jean Michel that he gave in uh, epistemology classes. If you consider the viral factory as the real viruses and the capsid just a box that makes it able to uh, transport the DNA material, then you can see that the program, the development program of viruses, is actually not much more different than what humans are actually the stem cells are just a box with the information program the dna information that enables to go from a metabolic metabolically active uh, process uh, to a dissemination uh, process to the reproduction of uh, the organism so this is personal opinion but i hope it will open a debate uh, in between us. I think that uh, viruses are not just a particle. It's actually more of a process and not an object. 
and sometimes at some point in this stage of development viruses can be considered as lively especially if you consider the metabolic activity occurring in the viral factory where the virus hijacks the translation apparatus of the host and to conclude i would personally consider that um, the viral DNA is not just a plan in a box, actually. It's actually the process that enables uh, to, uh, that enables, uh, that makes it able for the virus to be lively in the cell. So thank you everybody for having me in this lab meeting. I hope uh, I, I was able to make myself clear enough in English because um, this is my first presentation in English and I had really short time to prepare it. So I hope I was uh, clear and uh, that was not boring. And uh, once again, thanks for the invitation. It was really nice uh, working with you. And uh, of course, we will keep in touch uh, afterwards. Uh, thanks, Jan. It was a really wonderful presentation. Uh, and everything was okay with English and also. Um, now for the discussion, and maybe somebody have questions, uh, please. I, yeah. have, I have one question. Yes, yes. And thank you very much for your presentation, for enough good, enough uh, English and so and do you have any explanation why the virus uh, has so mosaic genome genes from archaea gene from eukaryote prokaryote and well uh, for instance uh, I can talk to you precisely about um, moly virus to see here for Molivirus Sibiricum, you have, uh, except the orphans, you have like quite a few genes that are coming indeed from other viruses or archaea or bacteria or eukaryotes. And actually, uh, all those 93 genes coming from viruses are mainly shared with Pandora viruses, meaning that those uh, mosaic genes might be the testimony of a past ancestry. If you look now at the eukaryotic genes that are found in the Molivirus cybericum genome, it's another question. Most of them are shared, uh, have homologous sequences in the host, Acantamoeba castellani. And one of the really interesting uh, discovery when uh, Molivirus uh, cybericum was first sequenced is that the major capsid protein that is encoded by Molivirus cybericum is actually found in the amoeba the strictly same major capsid protein, which is really strange why, why we should consider that the amoeba has acquired this gene that makes really no sense and it's really strictly conserved. And actually, if you look at the, uh, the other genes shared by Acantamoeba and moliviruses, most of them are not found elsewhere than in Acantamoeba meaning that it might have been a transfer from the virus to the host and not the opposite. Otherwise, we should, we should find all those shared genes in other eukaryotes, which is not the case. So if we focus on molivirus, the mosaic genes might come from either a past ancestry with Pandora viruses or um, a lateral um, horizontal gene transfer from the virus to the host. And all those uh, 17, gene, 17 genes here are really uh, difficult. It's really difficult to make any phylogeny and any supposition about the sense of acquisition. Is it from bacteria or archaea to viruses or the opposite? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, uh, one more question about the genome. Uh, maybe you know, uh, this is a strict topology of the genome. I mean, uh, the first part uh, where you have, uh, like, uh, parallels, for example, yes, and the second one where you don't have them, and so on. 
uh, if this situation exists uh, in uh, other viruses, in other giant viruses, or maybe other uh, small, let's say, small viruses with uh, a linear genome, or it's unique for, for molevirus? Well, actually, uh, when we discovered this for moliviruses, we started checking if it was the case for other um, others, uh, uh, other types of viral families. And the only thing we could uh, see is that the core gene set of the Pandora viruses uh, is actually having the same distribution along the genome, meaning that the all the concerned genes in between the Pandora viruses seems to be um, uh, on one part of the genome. Another thing that has been discovered in the Marseille virus, uh, Marseille viride family, is that all the proteins that uh, have a bare function, the known function, seem to accumulate on one side of the genome, but it's a circular genome, so there is no, no really reason to talk about one side, but at least there is a hotspot of uh, genes that are uh, having a known function, meaning that it could be uh, some genes that have been acquired from uh, either eukaryotes or uh, other species, meaning that you can probably say that in Marseille viruses you have the same process of uh, uh, of gene creativity on one specific region of the genome. Okay, thanks. Now, that's very interesting, I would say, because um, we are used to think about the genome as a kind of a more complex thing, and here you just have one part and the second part. Here you have one gene, one kind of gene, and here you can have another kind of gene. Yes. It's like, like too easy, I would say, but yeah, it's, it's maybe too hard to say why is it so. <laughs> yes, and and also because I try to hypothesize the reason why they have such a pattern and such a distribution, and I try to see using transcriptomic data if you had like for instance uh, early genes that were uh, on one specific side of the genome, and actually it's not the case. So the distribution it's it is not. Um, there is no correlation between the time of expression of genes and the distribution of genes along the genome. So perhaps it's just a matter of uh, uh, the way uh, the genome enters the nucleus. Uh, it pro perhaps enters uh, from a specific end and then the expression is then uh, I mean, there are so many possibilities, but the 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 hypothesis of um, the time of expression uh, depends on the position in the genome is wrong, and it's also wrong for mini viruses. You have like early genes that are uh, found randomly, uh, late genes again that are present random distributed randomly. So it's yeah. I mean, there are so many options. Okay, more questions, please. I have a question, please. Yes. Um, are there known viruses for yeasts? Sorry? You tell us about viruses of eukaryotic cells, mammalian cells, about bacterial viruses, ah. are they known yeast viruses? Uh, yeast viruses? Mm. It's true that I don't know if we have ever found some yeast viruses. Okay. This it's is a good question. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, sir. As I know, they are not founded, the uh, viruses for yeast. 
I think there are some yeast that can, I, I mean, at least I know that uh, you can find viruses and prions of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but it's true that I don't think, I don't, I think there are RNA viruses, not DNA viruses. Actually, the question is, uh, have you tried? Because um, usually ah. people probably just uh, work with one uh, laboratory strain of a cantinoba, for example, or three like you, right? And other people try another strain and they find another virus. So mm -hmm. maybe just pour this sample into the I, I, strain I, the, of the Well, actually, I have a bit of an answer. Sometimes when you do the, when we do, do you remember Stas when we did the reactivation protocol? Yes, yes. And we have a lot of fungi and bacteria that are uh, taking over cells by Acontamoeba cells at some point. And once or twice, I don't remember, but it happened that uh, you don't see any bacteria growth or any uh, fungi growth, but actually um, yeast. Once I had a flask that was full of yeast because it was actually uh, found in the permafrost samples that I used for the reactivation procedure was most probably infected by yeast and then the yeast started to grow in the PPYG medium and they took over the cells. So I would say that if at that time a virus could infect those yeast, I probably would have found some uh diminution of the population of yeast which wasn't the case okay that's very interesting thank you and uh, you, you probably uh are aware of um, the studies on uh, resistance uh, of some cantinoba strains from permafrost to modern viruses and so on. Uh, this is the paper we plan to publish but actually, I had abandoned to publish it because of those uh, discrepancies be, be, between different data. You probably know, yes. And, uh, the, 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 that initial strain was lost and so on. But anyway, uh, what was found actually by, by Jean Marie and uh, this girl, I forgot her name recently, is that. Uh, as far as I understood, uh, Chantal, uh, that uh, some acantamoeba cells are resistant in both uh, permafrost, uh, this is our strain from our lab, and in uh, this um, canonical laboratory strain of acantamoeba. So in, in any population, uh, there is a small percentage of uh, cells that are resistant to uh, giant viruses. And of course, in lab experiments, you always use a huge amount of viruses because you need a synchronous process and a quick process. And uh, probably you just don't observe uh, those tiny cells that are hidden in the corners of the flesh. <laughs> uh, escaping escaping from, from huge... And it, it, it's very you, interesting. Oh, uh, actually, yeah, the question, yeah, I, I will just conclude. The, the, the question actually is um, uh, how could they survive? I mean, I can't remember and uh, viruses. Uh, okay, this arm race, but uh, we don't observe it. We just put virus and the, and the can't remember dies. So, how could they survive and succeed in nature? <laughs> but actually, uh, for instance, if you take Mimi virus, you have 100% lysis of the cells. Like after the um, production uh, protocol, you see that all uh, the you don't see any uh, acantamoeba cells, even perhaps few cysts but that's it but if you take panora yeah. viruses or more viruses yeah but you put, you put 40 okay but you put 30 viruses per one acantinoba cell or at least uh, yeah. one virus yeah. per one acantinoba cell and in nature probably those amounts just do not occur right yes and also for instance the infectious cycle of 
when you see a flask of uh, Molly virus, you don't use it. There are still like about 30 to 40 percent of uh, acantamuevas that are living. They're not dead. They're not. Yeah, there is no a full disease. So either, and we know by experiments that uh, not all the particles of Pandora viruses and Molly viruses are infectious. Like the the the, per, the average of infectious viruses is really low. Mm, that's not hundred percent of viruses are infectious. So it's difficult for me to say either it's because uh, the amoeba is resistant or because the replication cycle is not productive for the virus because I don't any re can be any reason or because it has been infected by infectious viruses or it's it can be many options but to me there is probably um, some specific strains that can of acantamoeba that can be resistant I, 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 I've, I, I've been doing such a work with one of my um, uh, master student and uh, we, we, we saw that some strains of acantamoeba are more sensitive to some viral families while others are strictly resistant or strictly sensitive so yeah. there is not binary like all acantamoeba are not infected the same way and the cycles are not pro as productive for each yeah. strain of acantamoeba yeah no. thanks uh, could we talk later about this data because it's very interesting from the show yeah. And if you I, think I'm for instance, no, but there is another another really interesting thing is that if you take for instance uh, the metagenomes of uh, the samples we uh, uh, we collected from uh, Siberia and uh, all the permafrost cryosols um, soil samples we have. Uh, for instance, I did the metagenome analysis of the sample where I recovered Molivirus Kamchatka. And uh, you have about uh, 30 million reads. And you had only seven reads per ends, meaning 14 reads uh, if you take single uh, single head reads. That was that were uh, matching 100% to uh, Molivarus Kamchatka, meaning you have less than uh, one um, viral particle per uh, million. You have like 0.1 uh, viral particle that are actually found in the sample. So the probability for reactivation is actually really low meaning that perhaps you have like a huge amount of viruses that are not uh, I mean the the, the, the the quantity of virus in the sample is really low if you use okay. metagenomic data to prove that the virus is actually truly in the sample mm -hmm. for instance I, I thought okay since I was able to reactivate Molivirus Kamchatka from the sample I should found a lot of it in the sample through metagenomic analysis. I should found at least a full genome of Molivirus Kamchatka in the, but actually not, not at all, not at all. I only found uh, seven reads that statistically is significant to say, okay, the virus was actually in the sample, but it's far, far less than what I expected, meaning that the concentration of viruses in the sample is like super low. Okay. Is it is it a typical situation for giant virus? Because I remember Jean Michel told me something similar about other samples. So you you recover virus and you found just a few few reads in the metagenome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so this, it, this is something. Yep. Yeah. So it's, it's in in other samples of the same thing occurs, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is typical. We, for instance, so far we have tw 12 metagenomes uh, from permafrost or at, no, cryosoils. Let's say cryosoils because you have active layers and stuff. 
but uh, we weren't able to recover a full genome assembled by metagenomics in either of those samples. Okay, very interesting, thank you. <laughs> ah, you're welcome. Anybody is welcome also with your questions and we need to, to close our very interesting discussion because we are already talking two hours. <laughs> yes, Maria? Oh, okay, um, I'd like to ask, um, uh, in addition, the question about um, do uh, the survived amoebas uh, have any specific uh, properties d due to the viruses uh, in its, uh, for example, long or short life cycle, any metabolite uh, changes, uh, uh, how uh, amoeba you <laughs> you yeah, that's a good question. Um, I can't really tell you because for us at the moment, it's really difficult to do uh, some uh, gene editing in Aconta Mueva. We are not close to, uh, at, at the moment, we're, for instance, pretty close to uh, succeed in uh, shutting down some Aconta Mueva genes. But uh, to tell you if there is some metabolic changes in acontamuebas that are still living after uh, infection by some virus, giant viruses, uh, we don't have the tools to answer this question at the moment. Okay, maybe it is super amoebas. <laughs> yes, most probably. <laughs> most probably. But also, what is really difficult is that I, I run some few experiments on uh, amoebas that were supposed to be resistant to uh, some Pandora viruses. Like I, I, I let the infectious cycle run for a few days and I collected as Stas proposed earlier to collect just the amoebas that were supposed to be resistant or at least that were not dead, that dead at the moment. I, uh, we cultivate it, we transplant those amoebas and actually, you have the same phenotypes if you reinfect them. Like 70% uh, of the amoebas, even though they're strictly clones from uh, the one that were selected previously, they're s sensitive in, uh, again. It's pretty... So it can be a shutting down mechanism that turns in and out depending on the condition or it's really difficult. I have no answer. Thank you. Okay, if we have no more questions. Um, but I, I have kind of yeah. question for uh, all of you. Uh, this is for, because, uh, yeah, I, I, I think there is something really interesting in both of our work in our uh, labs is to work on old samples. And I'm really curious to know if, for instance, if you have a uh, protozoan diversity in some Pleistocene samples, is uh, just this... a moment, Jean, Jean, Jean. I, I think uh, yeah. I need to know that it's not a lab seminar, it's like a common for push, you know. So uh, there are different people interested in different biological things, okay? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Not only protistologists. Uh, right. Right, right. No, but my question was more, um, uh, I think there is really interesting work to do on the reactivation of uh, protozoan from Pleistocene and try to assess the diversity of viruses that were uh, present at the same period using old strains of protozoa, uh, protozoans. Uh, definitely. <laughs> this is what we have tried, right? <laughs> yes, no, but I mean, uh, that wasn't my topic of PhD, the topic of my PhD, but still this is something I would like to, you know, meaning that anyone, anytime you <laughs> witness some weird thing happening on the on any type of cell, just have in mind that uh, it can always be viruses. 
Yeah, that, that, that's a good point, right? And what are your plans for, for the future after your PhD at the time? Well, uh, I applied for a one-year contract for um, professor assistant in the University of Marseille so that I can uh, do a, try to be a teacher as well as a researcher, young researcher. Uh, this contract allows me to do 60% uh, teaching and 40% uh, experience time. I mean, it's uh, part time uh, in between uh, experiment and teaching. And after this one year contract, I want to um, to develop some skills uh, that are not pure scientific skills. Uh, for instance, I want to every there is a, you know, um, France has some uh, scientific uh, bases around the world, like in Antarctica and two islands in the Pacific and the Arctic Circle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And every year there are some uh, expedition that are uh, uh, set up to uh, those places. During okay. okay. That's that's and, very yeah. And at the same time, uh, because the selection process to go in those expeditions is really hard. Like uh, it's it takes six months to be selected, and uh, during those six months of uh, you know uh, interviews, uh, psychological tests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I want to develop some uh, skills on uh, uh, navigation. Like I want to to have a diploma that takes six uh, that takes two months to get for a sailor level one sailor, so that I can know how to manage on a boat. And I would also like to uh, do. Um, uh, mechanician uh, certificate and uh, perhaps I was thinking with Jean-Michel that it could be interesting for me when I will be in the expedition during uh, the winter time since you're confined most of the time I would like to do online classes of Russian so that I can develop also uh, a new new skills on uh, you know talking in Russian so that I will be able to speak Russian, English, and also Greek from my uh, father's uh, language, which is my uh, second language in my family. So that after the expedition time, I will be able to, you know, to try to enter in uh, public research through the... Uh, more on the side of you know running expedition how to make uh, expedition and uh, international collaboration etc mm -hmm. etc really interesting in this i, I can imagine uh, these are these are the plans for like next 10 years right? <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah you have That's everything what? planned okay, okay. No. Okay. no but okay. to okay. me it's it's um because I don't want, you know, I, I don't feel uh, confident enough to do this uh, usual, uh, purely academic uh, plan. Yeah, like I, doing I, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I will be really glad to talk to you privately about all these things, but probably they are not so interested for, interesting for others. <laughs> yes, sorry. yes, yes, yes. So, <laughs> We have we, we are asking. talking. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. But uh, I, I was thinking about some scientific things, like. You know. But okay, you you answered anyway. So thank you everybody for being here, being in quotes today, and I, I hope you enjoyed this uh, seminar. Thank you, Eugene, for such a beautiful presentation. I am sure everybody was. Really to, to hear about uh, giant viruses and uh, welcome back at some time. <laughs>
<laughs> and and the, I have one comment for Eugene. If you are going to visit Moscow or Pushina, please notify me or Stas. It will be nice to to see you in life. Yes, sure. That's that's the plan actually. But uh, I will. Uh, if you want Stas or uh, with uh, Evgeny as well, we can arrange this and perhaps have another meet meeting so that we can discuss it because it fits with my career plans also. So we need to really have a, a proper talk about it. But thank you for the invitation, of course. Yeah, that's great because this is actually one of the goals of our scientific open seminar. Uh, to make new collaborations, to make easier uh, finding the collaborations. So, once more, thank you, everybody. And you may stay here in this uh, main channel to talk to each other, uh, if you wish, as long as you want. Um, and welcome back next Saturday. And uh, next Saturday, we have... Uh, we have a presentation by mm, Abdullah Tipo Hazad, right? Uh, but Neil, uh, oh, oh, oh. I need sometimes to translate it into English. Uh, some com computational methods in modeling of uh, ferrum nickel hydrogenesis. Okay. Which is literally method of modeling железо nickelевого гидрогена. So it's again about uh, applying math to biology. So actually, Jen, you are also welcome, but it will be in Russian this time. Sorry, <laughs> you can practice in Russian. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, and uh, bye bye. Have a nice weekend. Thank you very much.